Hey, great tens. So we are now on the last lesson of unit six, uh, which is really great because like I said, uh, unit seven and unit eight are, I would say considerably shorter than the other units. So that means we're really near the end of the course. Uh, so we just have a little bit more to go. So the functions, which is basically the word problems. Um, so because of this, it's really, really important that you do pay attention to this lesson because uh, there's a lot of important information that comes here. Um, so just bear with me here. So what we're going to talk about is just uh, identifying sinusoidal functions and real life uh, word problems. And then of course, we're going to be looking at how to solve problems that involve the application of these functions. So a quick little recap here. We learned that a graph is sinusoidal in nature. Um, if it is a transformation of the sine or cosine graph, and if it is, then we can model it uh, using um, the equation a sine kx minus d plus c or the transformation of the cosine function, which is a plus c. Um, so if a graph is sinusoidal, then that means that we can identify the, each of these parameters, a, k, d, and c, uh, just by looking at the key points of the graph. So we talked about this already, that to find the, the, the most of these parameters, if we use them, if we look at the minimum and maximum, um, point, that's quite easy. Uh, the length of the cycle, which is the period, will also tell you what the k value is. That's going to help you find the k value. And uh, looking at where the cycle starts and ends, that's going to help you figure out where what the phase shift is going to be. And the phase shift, like I mentioned, um, we didn't talk about it as much, but we're going to discuss it in more detail in this lesson. So how do you actually want to find the closest complete cycle to the y-axis? Um, again, you don't have to find the closest one to the y-axis. It is possible to find any, you can find any complete cycle that's on the graph. Um, but generally speaking, you want to make your life easy by picking a cycle. You don't have to, like I said, but it just makes your life easy. Um, and again, if it starts in the middle, and I think we discussed this, if the cycle begins near the middle of the graph, or the equation of the axis of the curve, and we know what that is, so let's say EOA. So if it starts near the middle, the equation of the axis of the curve, then it, it would be best to model it using the sine function. And if the cycle begins at the maximum or at the minimum point of the graph, the peak or the trough, then it would be better to use the co to transform the cosine function. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about whether which one is better. Um, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, but first objective. Your second um, step here is to look at that cycle and just look at that one cycle. Don't look at the multiple ones, just look at one cycle. And using that one cycle, tell me what the amplitude is, find out what the equation of the axis of the curve is. And again, these two you can easily find using the max or min. The period is also quite easy. You just have to find out how long the cycle lasts and the phase shift move. Did the cycle move from the y-axis? That's really all you're looking at. And once you have your A, C, K, and D values, you simply sub them into your equation, just like we looked at before. You sub in A into the amplitude into A, you sub in the um, equation axis of the curve into C. We looked at that already. Uh, remember, K is going to be 360 divided by the period. And the phase shift is always a bit of a tricky one. Um, this is the one that gets a little bit uh, EOA. So I'm just filling it in here. And this is the amplitude. So the D is always a bit of a tricky one. It depends on which, um, which function you're transforming, whether it's the sine graph or the cosine graph. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but really what you're doing for the phase shift is you're looking at how far away it is from the y-axis, okay? So if it's to the left of the y-axis, it's gonna be negative. If it's to the right, it's positive. The nice thing about this is that regardless of what cycle you choose, the amplitude, the equation of the axis of the curve and the period are actually always gonna be the same regardless of which cycle you choose. It doesn't actually matter. You can choose a different cycle than someone else. You're gonna have the exact same amplitude, the exact same equation of the axis of the curve and the period, right? If um, is your phase shift and the sine of A. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So luckily, there's only two parts of this that will actually change, and that's the phase shift and the sine of A. And we'll discuss that in more detail. So a lot of writing here. Again, um, I always mention this, the cohort that's at home. Um, no, sorry, I'm going to interrupt the bottom. The cohort that is at home, please uh, do not worry about writing all this down. Um, if you listen to me, if you listen to see the examples, visualize them, understand them, you don't have to copy everything down. Um, I have a lot of writing because I'm not sure. I know some people don't like to look at the videos and they rather just kind of read along. So if you're reading along, then this is all the description. If you're not reading along, then just listen to me, okay? So uh, as I mentioned already, you can either transform sine or cosine. Now this is where it gets a little bit hard. You don't actually, there's no rule of thumb that tells you you should always transform sine this if you have this or always transform cosine if you have that. Um, what you're really looking at is which one would be easier for you depending on the context. So what you want to do more than anything is really have it stored in your memory what the sine what the sine graph looks like and what the cosine graph looks like. Again, the sine graph, just a little review here, starts in the equation of the axis of the curve, it goes to the max, then goes to the equation of the axis of the curve, EOA, or the middle, I always call it the middle sometimes, just for short, 
and then it goes to the minimum value, and then it goes back up to the EOA or the middle point, okay? Um, the cosine graph starts a little bit differently, right? Remember, it's, it's basically shifted 90 degrees to the right. So the cosine graph is going to start at uh, the max, then go to the minimum, and then it's going to go to, sorry, not the minimum, sorry, the middle, the equation axis of the curve, then it goes to the minimum, then it goes back up to the middle point or the equation axis of the curve, and then it goes back up to the max. So notice that um, that the sine graph. If you if you notice that this if you notice that the cycle, whatever cycle you choose, if you notice that it starts at the axis of the curve or the equation axis of the curve, the EOA, then and and then it goes back up to and then it goes up to the maximum point. Then you likely want to choose uh, if that is the case. If that's the cycle that you're looking at. Then you likely want to pick it, uh, pick a uh, positive sign as your, as the as the function, the sinusoidal function that you're transforming. It just really depends on which, um, what direction the the graph is moving in, right? So if you notice that you're trying to model a graph that starts at the equation axis of the curve or the middle of the graph, then goes to the max, then goes to the middle, then goes to the minimum, and then goes back up to the middle, then you probably want to choose the positive sign function. And again, you want to make sure that A is greater than zero. But if you notice, I'm just going to erase this. If you notice that your graph starts at the middle, but then it started going to the maximum, it actually goes the other direction. It goes to the minimum. And then from the minimum, it goes to the middle. And then from the middle, it goes to the max, the other way around. You notice that basically everything is in reverse here, right? So it's a reflection on the x-axis. So because of that, you actually will still transform the sine function. But one subtle difference, you want to make sure that the A coefficient is negative. So notice the big difference between the sine function, sine x, and negative sine x. The big difference there is that for positive sine x, we went from the equation of the axis of the curve to the maximum. And for negative sine x, we went from the equation of the axis of the curve to the minimum, um, which is um, negative one. So it's just a subtle difference as to where, whether you went to the to the maximum right after the right after the equation of the x by the way it's supposed to say maximum sorry I'm making mistakes left right and center here apologize for that guys that's supposed to say max let me just change that here yeah so it depends on whether you're going to the maximum from the equation of the axis of the curve or you're going to the minimum from the equation of the axis of the curve so if you have a graph that starts seems to start near the middle then you probably want to pick to model it with the sine function. Now it's a matter of, you know, do I model it with the positive sine function or the negative sine function? Well, that depends. If it goes from the middle straight to the max, then you want to use positive sine. If it goes from the middle to the minimum point, you want to use negative sine, right? Which means that the A value needs to be negative. Now, if the cycle starts at the maximum point of a graph, and then you want to model it using cosine graph. And why do we want to use the cosine graph? Well, this one's actually pretty easy to tell. We know that the cosine graph starts at the maximum, goes to the equation of the axis of the curve, then goes to the minimum, then goes back up to the equation of the axis of the curve, and then goes back up to the maximum. So if it starts at the maximum and ends at the maximum, then you know you want to choose the cosine function because that's the one that most closely resembles it. So you always want to look for the, like I said, the cycle that is closest to the y-axis just to make life easy for yourself. So the cycle, whatever cycle you choose, doesn't matter which cycle you choose, but the cycle you choose, if it starts at the maximum point, you probably want to model it using the cosine function. But if the cycle starts at the minimum point, and notice that the minimum point would mean that it's a negative cosine function, then you want to just make sure you model it with the negative cosine function, which basically just means that you're ensuring that the A value is, neg is, is less than zero. And again, if we compare the, the positive cosine function with negative cosine, uh, we notice that the only difference is that there's a reflection on the x-axis. So instead of starting at the maximum, we start at the minimum. So if your graph starts at, if your cycle that you choose starts at the minimum, then you want to make sure that uh, you model, you transform the negative cosine function, which essentially means all the parameters are the same. Like I said, none of the parameters are different. The, there are only two that change, the phase shift, and the sign, just the sign of the A coefficient or the A variable there. Uh, so we can see here that it's only the, the sign of the A value that changes, right? We just make sure that it's negative. So how do you identify the parameters in the equation?
So if you're finding the equation, whether it's um, transformation of sine or transformation of cosine, uh, we know the following. So this is actually, again, a big review of lesson four and five. And I apologize, guys. I feel like I'm repeating a lot of the material. Um, I know it's kind of boring, but if anything, I'm hoping that the more you see it, the more you understand it. So, hey, this is the third time around that we've seen this. So hopefully this helps. So we know that the absolute value of A is going to be the amplitude. Um, the phase shift, as I said already, we don't tend to start look at the phase shift a lot, but now we're starting to look at it more. The phase shift tells you where the graph, the cycle will start. It just depends on which cycle you decide to look at. If you decide to look at, for example, I'm making this up here, but let's say that we notice that at 145 degrees, I'm making this up randomly, we have a cycle that looks like that, that starts at the maximum point. Well, if that's the case and you decide to focus on this cycle here, then you would just have a phase shift of 145 degrees. It just depends on which cycle you decide to look at. And you could look at, you know, a cycle that starts over here or a cycle that, you know, maybe starts over here to the left. It doesn't really matter, right? We can pick any cycle on the graph as long as it's it's easy to read for ourselves. And again, depending on where which cycle you choose, that's your that's going to help you determine the phase shift. The equation of the axis of the curve is your c value. Uh, so we discussed that already. Uh, nothing too much to add there. And the k parameter, this is always the weird one. The k parameter, people tend to confuse it with the period. Remember, it's not equal to the period, but the period will help us. Uh, so to find the k value, we simply take 360 degrees and you divide by the period. Um, as I mentioned already, um, we normally will tend to focus on um, that writing, we normally would tend to just focus on K. Uh, we don't even worry about the absolute value of K because most of the time we're not going to be looking at negative K values anyways. Um, so you can just kind of ignore that absolute value there. Uh, but technically we do put an absolute value there for that one um, in, the, in the formal definition of the K value, right? So we take 360 degrees to divide by the period. So again, when you're finding the amplitude and the equation of the axis of the curve, I'm not even going to go through this. You can read it on your own. I hope you have this in your notes because as you probably have seen a couple of times, it comes up multiple, multiple times. So again, there is a formula to help you easily find the amplitude and the equation of the axis of the curve. Um, I either I recommend not necessarily memorizing that, but just understanding where it's coming from. But of course, you know that your tests are open books. So by all means, um, Remember this slide, right? Um, and actually this formula comes up in multiple spots. So just make sure you have it jotted down in your notes there. Um, and again, the one thing you need to be careful with, as I mentioned already, the D, the phase shift is one of them. It depends on which, uh, which cycle you look at. So it's gonna be your choice of cycle. So everyone's gonna have a slightly different answer depending on what the cycle, what cycle you choose. Um, the one other difference is that if you decide to model it with negative cosine or negative cosine, you just need to make sure that you watch out for the sign. The sign of it will be uh, negative if you decide to use negative sign, if you decide to transform negative sign or negative cosine. Okay, that's the one little subtle difference there as well. But other than that, everything else is pretty much exactly what we saw in lesson four and five. So again, lesson six, it seems like it's hard, but a lot of it is basically looking, reviewing other concepts we talked about. So nothing too, too different. And we have talked about amplitude and equation of the axis of the curve from day one. So the good thing is some of these concepts are literally just review, right? We're not really changing much. So let's look at the first example here. Determine the equation of the sinusoidal function below. All right, let's start with the easy stuff. What's the equation of the axis of the curve? Well, I personally always like finding the equation of the axis of the curve. It's very easy to tell, especially in this graph. Um, I can clearly see here that the equation of the axis of the curve is zero, right? Um, so it doesn't really change from the original sine function, at least the EOA. Um, the amplitude is two, right? The equation, that's basically the distance, half the distance from the max to the min, or we can look at it as the distance from the equation of the axis of the curve to the minimum or the equation of the axis of the curve to the maximum. And we can clearly see here that the amplitude is two. So that means our A value is two, Luckily, I always like the fact that the A value corresponds with the amplitude, which also starts with an A, makes it really easy to remember. So our amplitude is two, our equation of the axis of the curve is zero, which means our C value is zero, right? Because the EOA is the C value. Um, the period, well, what's our period? In this case, our period is actually, um, and again, it depends on which cycle you decide to look at. 
let's say I'm going to look at the one that starts closest to the y-axis, which actually, which is really just starting at the origin zero, zero. And I can clearly see here that this is basically the sine function, right? Because uh, it starts at the equation axis of the curve, goes to the max, goes back down to the equation axis of the curve, goes to the minimum, and then back up to the equation of the, of the axis. So equation of the axis of the curve. So really, because um, this is just following the same pattern as the sine function, I don't have to um, use negative sine, and I my phase shift is still going to be zero. So that's actually pretty easy. Uh, so nothing too tricky there. Again, I already mentioned this. If I decide to use positive sine, which makes the most sense, I don't have a phase shift. I have a phase shift of zero. That's pretty simple. Uh, which means I don't have to really change anything in the input other than just changing the k. Actually, I don't even have to change anything in the input because the k value is also one. So that means I end up with the equation of, of two sine x. So again, pretty simple in this case because the only change was the a value. That's the only thing that changed. Uh, there were no other changes to the graph itself. Um, so pretty simple example there. Again, all I'm really doing, and I'm showing you step by step, and you don't have to do this on the test. Um, the a values is two. The k values is one, which means that nothing changes to the input. Um, the d value is zero, so really nothing changes there in the input there. Um, and then, of course, our c value is zero. So if we're adding zero, then nothing happens at the end there. So notice that technically, um, not that I would suggest this, but technically I could have modeled this using the cosine graph. So if you're wondering, how would I have done that? Well, I would go back up here and say, well, you know what? Why don't I, whoops, going back here. Why don't I start, uh, why don't I look at a different cycle here? I'm actually going to start looking at a cycle that starts 90 degrees to the right. And if you notice, it's actually not fully complete. But if you continue this graph on, you can see here that it would end at uh, 450 degrees. And you can even check yourself, 450 degrees minus 90 degrees is a total of 360 degrees. So it is possible for me to have looked at the neg, uh, positive cosine as, a, as, as, the other, um, as the other function that I could have uh, transformed. So if I had decided to transform cosine function, the one, what, what changes would I have made? Well, um, instead of it being x minus 0, there would actually be a phase shift, but the phase shift would be 90 degrees. So I would switch this to 90 degrees. This would switch into cosine instead of being sine. Um, the A value wouldn't have to change because um, it is still going to, we're still modeling using positive cosine, right? We're still not actually looking at uh, a negative cosine or a negative sine. So the sign there is still going to be the same. But notice it's just the, the function itself, instead of being sine, it's cosine, and the phase shift that changed. And of course, if I decided to look at, and this is just another example, we'll do a couple more of these. Um, if I decided to look at negative sine, Let's say I decided to look at a cycle, uh, sorry, negative cosine. Let's say I decided to look at a cycle that starts with uh, the minimum at negative 90 degrees and then ends at the next consecutive minimum. Uh, well, we would notice that it would simply be instead of 90, uh, x minus 90, it would be x plus 90 degrees because we're moving 90 degrees to the left. And then in this case, I would have to switch that 2 into a negative 2. And of course, this sign would switch into negative uh, cosine. So there would be more differences, more changes to make, but notice that ultimately the A, uh, the absolute value of A, the C value and the K value would not change at all. So there are changes, but not super, not too many significant changes, right? Uh, we just have to kind of make sure we change the, the phase shift and the, and the sign of the A coefficient, and obviously whether it's sine or cosine. Um, so let's look at another example. This is a little bit trickier. So determine the equation of the sinusoidal function given below. Um, so this one, again, I don't think it's as obvious which, which um, whether you should, you should model it using sine or cosine. It really depends on your own preference. But in my opinion, what I think would be best is to actually model it using cosine. Now, I don't know about you, everyone's a little different on this, but I personally, the, the first cycle that I tend to look at, and everyone's going to be different in terms of what cycle they choose, but I personally saw this cycle first. And again, it depends on which one you decide, but I personally just even, even looking at it this first, um, I think I've done this question before, but obviously just looking at it myself right now, I'm looking at this and thinking, hmm, this is the most, this is the first cycle I saw. So I'm going to go with this one. This seems to be the most logical one. 
it's the closest to the y-axis that I can see. And I always, this is my personal preference, I always like to look at cycles to the right of the y-axis. You could look to the left, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that. I just tend to always look to the right of the y-axis. So I can clearly see here that that is my cycle. So how can I use that to find the A, K, and C values? So notice the phase shift. I'll kind of leave it to the end. Um, it's actually not hard, but I just wanted to kind of leave it to the end there. So let's start with the easiest. Is negative is positive four, and my minimum is negative six. So how can I use that to help me find the amplitude? Well, my amplitude is simply the difference between the max and the min. So four minus negative six divided by two. Again, if you make a mistake and you forget the signs, remember, look at your graph to verify. Uh, so four plus six is 10. 10 divided by two is five. So my absolute value of A is five. So I know for sure, regardless of whether, which, whichever cycle I choose, my amplitude, the absolute value, um, because when we find the C value, which is my equation of the axis of the curve, we know that this is going to be the average of the maximum. So four plus negative six is negative two divided by two, and that gives me negative one. Kind of makes sense looking at my graph here that the equation of the axis of the curve is negative one. Makes sense so far? So knowing, uh, having these two pieces of information, we can actually pretty clearly see on the graph here that the amplitude would be five because that's the difference between negative one and four. And the difference between negative one and positive and negative six is also um, five. So my amplitude is definitely five. You can even see it graphically. Um, and you can see it uh, algebraically as well. My amplitude is five. My equation axis of the curve is negative one. Now, personally, I always find the equation axis of the curve easy to define, but I don't know if it was just if it's just my eyes. Sometimes my eyes fool me. Um, it's not that actually that obvious that negative one is the horizontal line right in between. At least for me, for visually speaking, it was not that obvious. So this is one of those cases where having the formula is really really helpful, right? Make sure you follow it through. So again, the equation axis of the curve is simply the average of the maximum. So we have our C value of eight. Um, so we now have to look at the period to help us find the um, the k value. So we see here that our period is going from do, 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 what is this? So we have seems like each square is thirty degrees. So two hundred ten degrees minus thirty degrees. What is that? That gives us a total of one hundred and eighty degrees. So this is our period. So how can we use that to help us find the k value? Well, the k is simply going to be three hundred sixty degrees divided by 180 degrees, which means K value is two. Perfect. So we have our A, K, and C values, uh, parameters. So the only thing I'm missing now is just to find the phase shift. Well, the phase shift, again, uh, we can see here that it, I decided to use this, um, with this cycle here that starts at the maximum, I'm gonna be looking at a uh, positive cosine. And I can see here that this positive cosine cycle starts 30 degrees to the right. So that means my phase shift, which is D, is 30 degrees to the right. So I just write positive 30 degrees. So I put all this in my graph here. And actually it's funny because I think I ended up choosing some which cycle you would have chosen. Let's actually go through, like I said, let's just focus on the, the yellow highlighted one. This is the one that I ended up using. Um, because I decided to focus on the, um, the cycle that starts at the maximum, and this is the one in yellow actually. Sorry, I should have actually done the same color there. So this is, since this is the one in yellow right here, uh, this starts at the maximum. This is the one that starts at the max. It makes sense that it would be positive cosine, right? Because positive cosine starts at the maximum and then goes to the minimum and then goes back up to the maximum. So if I decide to use um, this cycle, the, the positive cosine uh, cycle, then I know it's going to have a phase shift of 30 degrees. And I personally think that that's the most obvious choice. I'm um, sorry, if I decide to transform the sine function, um, notice that the sine function has to start at a different point. So if I go into, if I look at my graph here, and this is actually drawn in green, Notice that in green, if I had looked at this cycle that starts at the equation of the axis of the curve, the problem with this is that the equation of the axis of the curve, first of all, is not that obvious. I don't think it was as obvious this time, um, is negative one. But the problem is that you don't actually know what, um, what the corresponding x coordinate would be here, right? We don't actually know like what degree it has to be so that we have a y value of negative one. It's not that clear. Um, however, we can kind of deduce that it's between zero degrees and 30 degrees. So it would kind of make sense for it to be 50 degrees. But the problem with that is that it's not actually that clear. Because if you can see here, that cycle in green actually starts running between zero and 30 degrees, but it's not 100% clear where it is exactly. Well, luckily, you could actually do a little bit of math to find a more accurate answer or to, or to verify at least that correct. Well, you can look at this and say, all right, well, let's, let's think about this step by step. We know that the period is 180 degrees, right? So we already know that. So we know it's 180 degrees. So we know that the maximum occurs at 45 degrees. So then you have to think to yourself, okay, if the maximum occurs at 45 degrees, 
when is the next quarter uh, that we're looking at, which is the equation that acts as the curve. So remember we talked about this, how the sine function goes from the EOA to the max, to the EOA, to the minimum, and then back up to the EOA or the middle. So remember how our sine function is kind of split up into four different quarters. And same with the cosine function. It's just split up in slightly different ways, but split up into quarters there. So if I know that my maximum occurs at 45 degrees, how can I figure out when my previous EOA uh, occurs? When it, when the graph, when that cycle previously hits the EOA or the equation axis of the curve? Well, I could easily uh, split this up, split up the whole entire um, cycle of the graph of 180 degrees. I can split that up into quarters. So again, doing a little bit of math here, that means that each quarter in between, I could easily find out what they are by taking 180 degrees and dividing by four. So 180 degrees divided by four, that means that each of these quarters lasts for a total of, uh, so doing math here, so that would be 45 degrees. So I'm simply gonna take, oh, oh by the way, the maximum, I made a mistake there. I said the maximum occurs at 45 degrees. I was thinking of the answer, sorry guys. Um, the maximum occurs at 30 degrees. And we found that in the first part there. So that means that each of these quarters lasts for 45 degrees. So again, doing a little bit of math, luckily it's not too hard of math once you kind of draw this out, you know that the EOA, the first time it hits the EOA, the, the equation axis of the curve is going to be 45 degrees less than 30 degrees. So doing a little bit of math, when does that occur? That means that it occurs at negative 15 degrees, which kind of makes sense because that's what we were already thinking, right? We were already thinking that it was halfway between. But again, this is when you use your reasoning of, of the, the sine and the cosine graph being split up into quarters, right? So it just depends on which one you decide, uh, which cycle you decide to use. Now, there is another option here. Another option, and actually there's multiple options for this. Um, there's at least four options, I'll tell you that. Um, you also could have used, you also could have modeled using the negative cosine graph. What would have done is you would have simply chosen um, sorry, I'm trying to get the marker going here. Okay, it doesn't seem to work. That's okay. Uh, so if you want to use the negative cosine graph, you would have uh, looked at this cycle that starts at negative 90 and goes up to positive, up to uh, the maximum of four and then goes back down. Um, the, the cycle completely, sorry, negative, I said negative 90, it starts negative 60 degrees and goes all the way up to 120 degrees there. So that would have been another cycle that you could have looked at as well. Um, so if you had started with uh, negative, uh, negative 60 degrees, right? The cycle starting at negative 60 degrees and then ending at 120 degrees, you would have noticed that it would have the exact same period, right? The period would still be, and again, doing a little bit of math, negative 60, 120 degrees minus negative 60 degrees is 180 degrees. So still 180 degrees for the period. Uh, the only difference is that the phase shift is, is 60 degrees. And because um, it's a negative cosine that we're using, then the only difference is that you would simply put um, a negative sign in front of the A value, okay? So let's, having knowing that we have, like I said, we have three, at least three different options so far. There's technically other ones as well. Um, by the way, we also could have modeled it using negative sign. And again, I don't wanna get all the options and I feel like this graph is really messy, but I can go back to the original one. I just wanna show you one other type of graph we could have chosen. We also could have modeled this using the negative sine function. So if we want to use the negative sine function, again, we know that the equation of the axis of the curve is where the sine function would have to begin. But if it's going to be negative sine, that means it's going to go from the equation of the axis of the curve, the EOA, and instead of going to the maximum like we did here, we're going to go to the minimum. So we're going to be looking at this cycle here. So notice that this blue graph right here is the negative sine function. So because the negative sine function, everything would be the same. The only difference is that the A coefficient is going to be negative. And of course, your phase shift is going to be different as well. So that your phase shift is going to be 75 degrees to the right, because we see here that the cycle begins 75 degrees to the right of the y-axis. So let's look at the solution here. So we talked about how to find the solution. Let's put it all together. So the max and the min are given to us, which helps us find the A value. Perfect. The C value is negative one. Got it. Um, that we already talked about this, the period is definitely 180 degrees. We found that multiple ways. And then that means the cosine function. Then we obviously are going to model it with, uh, we're going to model it with a positive cosine function. And then we look at the, where the cycle begins. Since the cycle begins at 30 degrees, that means the phase shift is 30 degrees. So one possible solution is five cosine two X minus 30 degrees minus one. But there are other solutions as well, depending on which um, other, depending on which other cycle you chose. It's the positive, sorry, to, to model using negative cosine function, then my only difference is that I would have a phase shift. Everything would stay the same. The only difference is that the 
the phase shift would be negative 60 degrees. So um, in the function, I'm going to write x plus 60 degrees. And of course, because it's negative cosine, because I'm starting at the minimum, not starting at the maximum, um, then I would simply put a negative sign in front of the a coefficient. And that's really all I have to do there. So it would be negative cosine 2x plus 60 degrees minus 1. Again, if you're just curious, like sine function, nothing wrong with that. Um, but your answers would be, like I said, just a couple of small differences, right? So the a value would be the same. So again, going back to the sine function I could use. Sorry for going back and forth here. Uh, for my sine function, if I decide to use the green graph there, um, it would have a phase shift. We already talked about that, uh, 15 degrees. So the phase shift would change. So this would be 15 degrees. Uh, the amplitude would be the same, obviously, but and the sine actually doesn't change either because it's still positive sine. So I would use positive sine x to sine 2, and then it's going to be x plus 15 degrees. Because it's 15 degrees, it does, that cycle started, that positive sine cycle, positive sine cycle started 15 degrees to the right. And then, of course, I write minus 1 at the end. So just notice that there were just a couple changes there. Um, like I said, the sine might possibly change what it did in this case. Cosine switched to sine. And, of course, there was a phase shift of 15 degrees. Uh, sorry, of negative 15 degrees, which means I write x plus um, Again, the last one was a little bit tougher. This one's much easier. And if you recall, we have looked at this example three different times. Um, so I apologize for warning you guys. Um, I'm not going crazy. Like I know I have given you this example three times now. Um, but the reason I want to do this is because I want to kind of show you how to find different equations. In the last example, we only saw one obvious uh, one obvious equation that we could use, but I'm going to show you what would happen if I decided to model it differently. So let's figure out what the equation is by identifying the amplitude. Last example I gave you, we already did the amplitude. And actually, we've done this a couple times now. We found the equation x to the curve, perfect, which is the a and the c value, perfect. I'm not going to go over it too much. Now, if you decide to model it with the sine function, this is where it starts to differ. Um, oh, yeah, and our period was 3. So obviously, because our period is 3, that means the k value is uh, 360 degrees divided by 3, which is 120. So one, the one difference now is that we're considering whether you're going to use sine or cosine. If I decide to use sine, and this is the one that I had used initially, I would start right at uh, x is equal to 0. And so that, that makes the most logical sense. I would start at the equation x of the curve, then go to the max, then go back down to the equation x of the curve, then go to the minimum, and then go back up to the equation x of the curve. However, if I decided to start to, to model this using uh, the cosine function, that means I would have to start at the maximum, then go back to the middle of the equation to middle point, the equation axis of the curve, then go to the minimum, and then go back up to the equation axis of the curve, and then go back and then finally end at the maximum. So if I decided to model this using the cosine graph, notice that the k value is the same, check. The a value is the same, check. Um, now notice that the there, there could the sign could have changed, but because um, I'm modeling still with a positive cosine function. I didn't specify a sign because in this case, it's, it's just, if I don't specify a sign, it's positive cosine function. Um, notice that the equation axis of the curve is the same, check, right? Because we can see here that the middle horizontal line is still going to be two. Um, and of course, the D value is the only thing that changed, right? So it's just the D value, the, the phase shift that changes, right? So we notice here that this obviously changed. It's not going to be the same for both of them. So if I decided to go with the sine function, my phase shift is simple, it's zero. But if I decide to go with the cosine function, then I want to make sure I understand that if, and this is where you have to use your reasoning of the quarters. If we know that one period is three seconds, then you can take your cycle and you can split it up into any cycle, actually, on this graph, and you can split it up into quarters. So that means that the first quarter for the sine function is going to go from the equation axis of the curve to the maximum. The second quarter is going to go from the equation axis of the curve to the to the Sorry, it's going to go from the maximum to the equation axis of the curve. Uh, then the next quarter is going to go from the equation axis of the curve to the minimum. And the last quarter is going to go from the equation of the axis of the curve, sorry, from the minimum to the equation axis of the curve. So we go middle, max, max, middle, middle, min, min, middle, right? Um, so that if I know, if I want to try to figure out what's the phase shift that is required to go from this sine function to the cosine function, well, let's just do a little bit of math here. Let's figure out what how long each of these little quarters are. So each of these quarters is going to be three, which is the period of each, uh, which is the period of uh, the length of each cycle divided by four. So what's three divided by four? 0 0.75. That means that each of these little uh, segments of the graph is 0 0.75 seconds long. And again, I'm running out of space here, but just uh, assume I'm doing this correctly there, uh, that I'm writing this nicely there. So 0 0.75 seconds long in between each of these segments. So if I'm going from, if I'm trying to figure out, hey, how long does it take to go from the equation of the axis of the curve, which is the middle of the graph, to the maximum, it's just going to take 0 0.75 seconds. So that's how I knew that this phase shift would be 0 0.75.
So I hope that kind of makes sense so far. It's basically one quarter after the equation of the axis of the curve. And again, what where is that coming from? Well, that's coming from our um, the fact that any graph. So if we look at the sine graph, sorry, let me just put this up. If we look at the sine graph, we go from middle to max, middle to min. And again, middle remember is not actually an accurate word, but I just use it for when we talk about this the segments. So this is what the sine function looks like: middle, max, middle. Uh, middle min and then middle and then of course the cosine graph just goes a slightly different order but it's the same idea max middle min middle and then max and i ran out of space there but you kind of get the point there so again if you know what um, what one quarter of the period is then you can figure out where the other important segments of the graph would be so hopefully that makes sense. So again, the equation itself, let's put this together. So if I decide to model using the sine graph, uh, notice that the A value is the same for both of them. The amplitude is the same for both of them, even with the sine, right? They didn't change at all. Um, it's 120 degrees for the K value. Sorry, just 120. Um, the two is, this, the equation axis of the curve is uh, two for both of them. So I just write that at the end there. And the D for the phase shift for the sine function is going to be zero in this case. Uh, for the cosine graph, it would be 0 0.4 cosine of 120 uh, times x, sorry, 120 times x minus 0 0.75 plus 2. So notice the only difference here. I simply have to um, so have a phase shift of 0 0.75. So that was the one subtle difference. And of course, it, I switched from sine to cosine. Again, this is why I kind of wanted to revisit this example, because in the last in the last lesson we did, we just modeled using sine. But I want to show you we could have modeled using um different cosine or even negative sine and negative cosine right um so i don't want to go into too much detail here but if you did want to model this using uh negative uh, negative sign it is possible and again i don't want to take up too much time with this but if you did want to model with negative sign you would simply be looking at this cycle here and of course you would just have to figure out what is the phase shift well the phase shift is uh 1.5 so you would have a phase shift of 1.5 which means that that's the d value so your D value is 1.5. And what else would change? Well, the other change would be that instead of having 0 0.4 as the A value, it's going to be negative 0 0.4. So this is another possible equation. I just want to show you this. You raise negative 0 0.4 sine 120x minus 1.5 plus 2. So notice that a lot of the values would stay the same. C stays the same. K stays the same. The absolute value of A stays the same. It's just the phase shift that changes, right? Um, and then, of course, if you did want to use, um, if you did want to model using uh, negative, negative cosine, you could also do that as well. I'll just briefly show you this one. Uh, you simply look at this cycle here. I feel like this would be the easiest one. We could look at this cycle. And again, if you want to look at the phase shift, the phase shift might be a little bit hard because you might be thinking, hmm, I don't know exactly where that is. But again, you can find out what it is just by using your reasoning of periods, right? Um, how this the cycle can be split up into quarters. So if you want to find out what the x, sorry, where, where, what the phase shift is for this cycle. Remember that if the, the if the equation axis of the curve is at three is occurs at x is equal to three or the time of three, then you simply take away one quarter to figure out what this value is. So one quarter subtract. So we subtract off one quarter from three. That means that this occurs at two point two five. So if I decided to model this with negative the negative cosine graph, it would be negative zero point four um, uh, cosine. Of 120 x minus 2.25 and it's still going to be plus two like that okay so again i noticed that the a value is going to switch signs right and of course there's a phase shift so it's going to be uh 2.25 to the right and that's the only change there so hopefully that makes sense so far okay modeling problems using sinusoidal functions i'm going to skip this a little bit because we've actually talked about this already again a lot of these a lot a uh, couple parts of this lesson is repetition one big difference is that we're looking at it from the perspective of finding the equation so a little bit different i'll let you read this on your own basically if you're looking at a word problem you want to identify keywords so anytime it talks about radius it's probably talking about amplitude if the question talks about revolution or how long it takes to do rotation it's talking about period if it ever talks about the axle or the midpoint then you're really referring to the equation of the axis of the curve and anything that has to do with, um, you know, how long does it take to go all the way around or the distance around, it's asking for circumference, which, you know, is 2 pi. R. Ferris wheel with a radius of 50 meters is rotating around. You reach a maximum height of 32 meters after 6 seconds and a minimum height after 22 seconds. Use this information to write the equation modeling the height of the Ferris wheel over time. So what would be the equation for this? Now, note, we already did this example before, so I'm going to skip some of the parts a little bit faster just because 
as I mentioned already, we have done this question already. We just did it. We, I want to say we have finished. However, we did not uh, find out what the equation was. Um, so let's do it step by step here. So we are told in the question that the radius is 50 meters. So if the radius is 50 meters, then that's obviously how far we can go from the center. So mathematically, what that means, it's, it's the amplitude, right? Um, and as I mentioned already, anytime they mention radius, it's probably talking about amplitude. So we definitely know the amplitude is 15. And again, I say amp absolute value of A because um, we, we don't know for sure if the, if the equation is going to be um, modeling, is going to be a transformation of the sine or negative sine or positive sine or negative cosine. So positive cosine or negative cosine. So A could be negative depending on which function we're going to be transforming. Um, we know that the maximum is 32 meters, so the curve. So if we want to find the middle, uh, the height of the axle, which is the equation of the axle of the curve, we can just use the fact that the minimum height is two meters. So if the minimum height is two meters and the maximum height is 32 meters, what's the height that's in between the two of them? Well, that's just the average of the two, 70 meters. Um, and we talked about this already in, the, in lesson three, I believe, um, that, and again, this is our reasoning with uh, sinusoidal functions. We know that if it takes, if it takes a total of 16 seconds, to go, oops, actually it's the other way around, to go from the maximum to the minimum. So we know it takes 16 seconds to go from the maximum to the minimum. Then obviously, how long is it gonna to take to go from, to go all the way around? Well, we just have to add another 16 seconds to it, right? Because we basically know half the distance. And so 32 seconds, how long is it gonna to take to do one full revolution? So that means it's gonna take a total of 332 seconds to complete one full revolution, which is another way of telling you that the period is 32. So once I know what the period is, I can easily find the k value. And this is where uh, we start with the new stuff, right? So to find the k value, we simply take 360 divided by 32, and that gives us 11.25. So now that you know what the k value is, this uh, the k value, the a, the a value, and the c value, we're pretty much all done. The only thing we're missing now is to find the phase shift. This is where it starts getting a little bit hard. To find the phase shift, we have to consider which graph is most appropriate. Now, the problem with this um, is that there's no graph given to us, but this is when it's worth it to actually do a, a, like a brief little sketch of what this is looking like in real, in, on, on a graph, right? So we're told that at six seconds, we start at a maximum height of 32 meters. And at 22 seconds, we go back down to the minimum height of, of two meters. And again, this is a rough graph. This is not gonna be perfect, but just to give you an idea. So we know from our knowledge of sinusoidal functions that if a cycle starts at the maximum, which it does in this case, or at least that's the closest, that's the closest um, key point here, because it starts at the maximum, I should probably model it using the cosine graph. I could use the sine graph, by the way, uh, but I'm going to model it using the cosine graph because uh, we specifically are told that the maximum occurs after six seconds. Now, because the maximum height occurs after six seconds, that means that we can use, we can model it using the cosine graph, but we need to make sure that we have a phase shift of six seconds because the cosine graph doesn't start right away. It doesn't start at zero seconds. Again, when did this graph actually start? Well, I don't know for sure, but I can tell you right now the graph started somewhere around here between um, the equation axis of the curve and the, and the maximum height. So for a fact, I know for a fact that it's it didn't start at the maximum height. It started at six seconds. So that means we have to have a phase shift of six. So our equation is actually going to look like this. 15 cosine of 11.25, because that's our K value, um, T minus six plus 17. And if I did want to model this using a sine graph or a negative cosine graph or a negative sine graph, I could do this. But again, I would have to use my knowledge of of the quarters of. I want to show you how you would use this, use how you would model the sine graph using the sine graph, because it is a good question. You know, how would I model this with a sine graph? It is possible. So let's actually talk about that. What if I purposely ask you to model this with a sine graph? So again, I would draw what I know. So I know that I'll, actually, let me redraw this because we don't actually have negative height. So we're just at positive height there. So I know I have a maximum height of 32 meters, a minimum height of two. My equation axis of the curve is at 17. So what I have so far is that it starts at six uh, at a maximum height of uh, six seconds. Of, that's the maximum height is 32. The minimum height is at 22 seconds. Okay. So what do I know so far? So I'm just going to draw out the cycle so far. So it kind of looks like this. So someone's on the Ferris wheel. And again, obviously they have to go to the maximum height. So it's kind of looking like this. Duh, 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 duh. And then it goes back down to 22. So it's looking something like this. Of course, it keeps going on, right? But I didn't want, I didn't feel, I didn't have enough space. I was going to say, I didn't feel like doing it, but also I just didn't have space. But you can see here that it would just continue on until the very end. And of course, when is the person done the ride? It's 32 seconds after six seconds. 
which means that it's going to be at at uh, 38 seconds when they're going to be done. When they're going to be done that first cycle there, okay? If we start the cycle is started at six seconds. So the question now is, what if I decided to model using the sine graph? Well, you could do this. But remember, the sine graph has to start at the equation of the axis of the curve. Now, the problem with this is that we don't actually know. The question, did the question say it hits the equation of the axis of the curve at, you know, X number of seconds? It didn't actually tell us that. That's the only problem. But we could do this by just using a little bit of reasoning, right? This, has, this is when we use our knowledge of, of, of the segments of the graph. So if we know that this occurs at six seconds, this occurs at 22 seconds. And again, you can either use the graph or the Ferris wheel to help you out here. Um, how long does it take to get to this part right here, the purple right here in the middle? Well, you know it's going to be half the time between the six seconds and the 22 seconds. So what's the half the time between six seconds and 22 seconds? What would that give us? So that would be, uh, so six plus 22 divided by two, that would be 14 seconds, right? So that means that it would be at the 14 seconds after you started the, the ride, you're going to be at the equation of the axis of the curve. So we know that this is going to happen at 14 seconds. Now, what's another way you could reason this out? The other way you could do this is to split up your graph into quarters, right? Um, now, I know we didn't actually split up the whole entire cycle into quarters because we can't draw the whole cycle here. But we know that since the period is 32 seconds, that means that every quarter of a period, you're going to be going from the maximum to the middle or the middle, middle to the max or the middle to the minimum, or the middle to, or sort of the minimum to the middle, or whatever it might be, right? That's going to be basically splitting up your graph into quarters. So in our case, since it's the cosine graph, every eight seconds, and that's one quarter of 32 seconds, we're going to be going from the, we're going to be moving from one significant, from one key point to the next, right? So in this case, we're going from the maximum point to the middle point, or the equation of the axis of the curve. So that means we have to add eight seconds to get from, to find out when it's going to hit the equation of the axis of the curve next, which is uh, 14 seconds. So if I decided to model it using the sine graph, I could do it, but I would make sure that the phase shift is 14. So it would be 15 cosine of 11.25. So everything would stay the same, but the phase shift changes is going to be t minus 14 plus 17. Now there is one change that I missed. I don't know if anyone spotted that. What else am I missing here? So I am modeling using the sine graph. And again, it's the sine graph because it starts at the, because this cycle here, um, I'm going to draw this in purple here this new cycle that goes on for a bit is going to start at um, 14 seconds. So it's not going to be, again, we start at 14 seconds because this is the, this is when we reach the axle height, 14 seconds right there. So right in between six seconds and 22 seconds. So the question here is um, what else I'm missing in this equation? Cause I'm almost done, but there's something I'm missing. Well, because I started and because the cycle started at the equation axis of the curve, but then went to the minimum, not the maximum, it's going to be negative sine. Oops, and I forgot to write sine. Sorry about that. So it's going to be negative sine uh, because I started from the equation axis of the curve and I went to the minimum, not the maximum. So now this is my other equation that I could use if I want to model using a sine graph. So the hard thing with these questions, with these modeling questions, is that there's actually going to be multiple answers for this, right? And that tends to throw people off because they kind of don't understand. Sometimes when you look at the back of the book, you might think your answer is wrong. Uh, you might not be wrong, right? Um, it's just that you chose a different cycle. So depending on which cycle you chose, your answer might be slightly different. However, we talked about this. The A value, the absolute, and the K value will never change. The only things that should change are the phase shift, uh, whether it's sine or cosine, and the sine of A, right? Uh, but everything else should be the same. Let's look at an example where you're given the equation. So in this question, instead of being given a description, you're given the equation. Some people find this one easier, but again, just a different way to look at this. So if you're given the equation that models the height of a Ferris wheel on a Ferris wheel after T seconds, um, and you're given that it's 10 sine 20T plus 11, Let's answer these questions. First part, what's the curve is basically looking at um, what the middle point of the graph is. So the axis of the curve is 11. And what does that tell us? That tells us the height of the axle. So pretty simple. So the height of the axle of the first wheel is 11 meters. So that means that the middle point of the first wheel is 11 meters above ground. Um, what is the amplitude and what does that tell us? The amplitude is 10 and that's our A value. And what does it tell us? Well, that's just the radius of the Ferris wheel. Pretty simple. What's the maximum height and what is the minimum height? Well, the maximum height we know is going to be 10 plus the, the sorry, is going to be 11 plus the amplitude. So we take the equation axis of the curve or the axle height and we add the amplitude. And then to find the minimum height, we take the equation of the axis of the curve. So it's to find the maximum, we take the equation axis of the curve and we add, add the amplitude that's 21 meters. And to find the minimum height, we take the equation of the axis of the curve and we subtract the amplitude. And that gives us one meter there.
what is the period and what does this tell us? Um, what does this tell us about the Ferris wheel? So the period, to find the period, we look at the K value. So we know the period is going to be 360 divided by 20. So 360 degrees, well, actually, I don't need to put degrees there, divided by 20, that gives us a total of uh, 18. So what does that tell us? That means that it takes 18 seconds to go all the way around uh, the Ferris wheel. And then using this, and then for the last two parts, uh, we're going to be using the equation to find the height after five seconds. And then we're going to be looking at domain and range. So let's look at a couple more answers here. So we talked about the maximum height. That's going to be the equation axis of the curve plus the amplitude, which is 21. And the minimum height is going to be the equation axis of the curve minus the amplitude. And that's going to be one meter. And again, I hope that makes sense, right? If we're told, again, in this question, I think you can almost draw a picture. I think it always helps to do that. If you're told that the, the height of the axle is a total of 10 meters, oh, sorry, not 10 meters, 11 meters, and then we know that the radius or the amplitude is 10 meters, then we can easily figure out what the maximum height is. You're simply adding 10 meters to 11 meters. Um, so that gives us a total of 21 meters. And of course, the minimum height would just be 11 meters minus another, again, the radius underneath, which is 10 meters. That means that the minimum height is uh, one meter. So hopefully this makes sense so far. So the maximum height is 11, 20 meters, minimum height is, is one meter. And again, you could find that using the, the formula we, I've given you, or you could just do a drawing to help you visualize it. Uh, we talked about the period. Uh, the period is 18, which means that that's how long the cycle, uh, the, how long it takes to go all the way around the Ferris wheel. And again, make sure you know how to do these questions. There's one question in the textbook about um, someone that's going, they basically get, they, they go on the, I think it's like a propeller or something, and it's asking you to find the period, asking you to find the amplitude and what they mean. This is in the real life context. Okay, so to find the height after five seconds, all you're going to do in this case is simply sub in uh, T into, uh, sub in five into T. So you're, you're finding H at five, right? Uh, you're finding out what the height is after five seconds, which means you replace the T time with five. Um, so that's all we're doing for that last part, for part F. So we take our equation and we sum in five, and then we get the sine of, sorry, the function, sorry, the function at five, or the height of five is 10 times the calculator, figure out what 10 times five is, that's 100, obviously, uh, sine of 100, um, you're going to approximate that answer, multiply by 10, and then add 11, you should get approximately 20.84. So that means that the height after five seconds is 20.84. So domain and range. The reason I bring this one up is because, again, this leads to some uh, misunderstanding. So we talked about at the very beginning, um, this is in the last lesson especially, how the domain, actually in lesson four and five, that the domain of the different transformations of sinusoidal functions is always XCR. So you might want to think that the domain is XCR, but again, because it's a real life context, um, first of all, time cannot be negative, right? Um, and you're not going to be on that Ferris wheel forever, right? If the, if the domain is X here, that means you're on that. That's just, uh, you know, torture. I don't think that's what you want. So in this case, what we have to consider is that there's three full revolutions. So what we need to do is figure out, well, I know that each revolution takes 18 seconds. So if you're on it for three full rotations, that means that I am on there for a total of 54 seconds. So the first part of the question for the domain, I simply have to consider, you know, how long am I going to be on that ride? Well, if it's for three full revolutions, I simply take the three times I go around multiply by 18 seconds, that gives me 54 seconds and your maximum height. So it's one meter and 21 meters. So we simply state that the range is from one meter to 21 meters. And we simply say that H of T is between one and 21. And um, again, the range is normally gonna stay uh, the same regardless of the problem. And sometimes obviously there might be a limitation in the question. They might tell you, you know what, for some reason they stopped the ride early. So if, if it's, a, it's a matter of, you know, stopping the ride early because something happened and Obviously, you may not reach the full, right? It's just the domain you have to watch out for. So let's look at one last example here. This one's a little bit trickier. Um, so you're told, um, so the Canadian Hydrographic Service has measured the largest tidal range in the Bay of Fundy to be two meters at low tide and 24 meters at high tide. It takes 12 hours to complete one cycle. So we're going to use this time in hours. And then the second part of the question, use the equation found in part A to find out when the height reaches a height of 20 meters. Um, when the tide, I think that's what I meant to say, not when the height, when the water reaches a height of 20 meters in the first 24 hours. Okay, so for part A, what we're going to do is simply find out all the key, find out what the amplitude and the equation of the curve is. But in this case, it actually is a little more easy. It's easier to just find out what the, uh, what the K value is because you're actually told how long it takes to complete one full cycle. So because you're told how long it takes to complete one full cycle, you're really told the period right? Not directly, I didn't say this is the period, but I think it's pretty clear that the period is 12 hours. So if you know that the period is 12 hours, then that means my K value is simply going to be 360 degrees divided by 12, which is 30. 
um, we know the maximum height is 24 meters and the minimum height is two meters. So we can easily find the amplitude. Amplitude is the maximum n divided by two. Um, and then um, my equation axis of curve is just the average of the two, the maximum n, which is 13. So now that I know all this key information, it's pretty easy. I'm almost done here. So this is where we get to the hard part, the phase shift, right? The phase shift, as I mentioned already, depends on whether you use the sine function or the cosine function. Now, because you are actually told in this question that it's ranging from two meters, which is the low point, this is your minimum, and then it's going up to 24 meters in the high tide. In my opinion, it makes more sense to, to go with negative cosine. Now you could choose, do it differently, but if we use negative cosine, then there wouldn't be a phase shift. And the reason for that is because we were actually told what the minimum height is first. We'll have to look at a phase shift. Um, but for practice, again, just to change it up a little bit, I decided to go with the positive sign function. Let's say I decided to go with the positive sign function. That means that we would need to look at the next quarter of the period. Remember how we talked about the segments? We look at the next quarter. So instead of you going, starting from the minimum, middle, max, and then going to middle. So I'm just going to redraw this. So remember, we talked about this, how the cosine function, the negative cosine function would basically go in this pattern. It would go middle, minimum, middle, max, middle, minimum, right? Instead of going from max, middle, minimum, middle, max. So it's a little bit different than the cosine function. So if I decided to, to model it with negative cosine, with negative sign, just notice that the only difference would be that I would have to start at the middle point go to the max, then go to the middle point, and then go to the min, and then go back up to the middle point, which is the equation axis of the curve. So if I decide to do that, then that just means I need to um, move one quarter to the right, right? So one quarter of the period to the right. So we already know that if if we split, if our key points split up into quarters, we know that the whole entire period is 12 hours. So then we simply have to move three hours to the, to the right. And again, it's three hours because one quarter of 12 is three. So if I decide to use a uh, positive sign um, as my as the function that I'm, I'm transforming, then the only difference is my phase shift would be three. So I would simply write 11 sine 30 t minus 30, sorry, t minus three, sorry, 30 times t minus three plus 13. Now, again, I, like I said, mentioned already, at goal or the easiest one to model with. Uh, so it would have been 11 cosine of 30 t plus 13. So just showing you how I could do it differently. That's supposed to say... Oops, that's supposed to be T. Sorry, let me just erase that. 30T. Okay, and then that would be negative cosine. So I'm going to put the negative sign in front. That's the only difference there. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, and I, I hope you kind of understand the, the fact that, you know, we could have used two different two different models for this, right? But it just depends on what makes most the most logical sense. Here's at the low tide then goes it back up to the high tide. It would make sense to use negative cosine, but just to switch it up, I decided to model it with the sine function. Okay, so our next part, part B, um, it's asking you to figure out when it reaches a height, uh, when the water reaches a height of 20 meters. Now, this question is a little tougher. Um, so you could go about it different ways. You could try to draw a graph and try to estimate what it is, solve this algebraically. So if you wanna find out when the height is equal to 20 meters, well, let's just do this algebraically. Let h at t, the height, the function for height, uh, let it equal 20, right? So we're just going to figure out when h at t is equal to 20. Now, this is just a matter of solving equation, which we technically know how to do. I know we haven't really seen a lot of questions like this, but you can still solve it. So what do we do? Well, let's just use, again, go back to basics. In grade nine math, we learned that to solve for an equation, we are isolating for the variable, right? For the missing variable. We're isolating for t in this case. So what we're going to do is take away 13 on both sides so that we can bring everything to one side for t there. Then we end up getting 7 is equal to 11 sine of 30 uh, t, minus th t minus three. And then of course, my next step here, I'm gonna divide by seven on both sides. So this divided by seven on both sides, this ends up giving me seven over 11 is equal to sine of 30 times t minus three. So again, all I'm doing is simply isolating for, um, oops, I'm simply isolating for my missing variable. So again, I take away 13 on both sides. Let me just repeat that. Take away 13 on both sides, divide by 11. Again, we divide by 11 so that we can um, get sine, the sine ratio by itself. And then I end up with seven over 11 is equal to um, the sine of 30, uh, sine of 30 times T minus three. Now we're not done with this yet. Now what we're gonna do is simply take the sine inverse. And what I do when I take the sine inverse, I'm gonna find out what 30 times T minus three is equal to, but that's not gonna tell me exactly what T is equal to. This is the hard part. 
If I find the sine inverse of 7 over 11, that just tells me what's 30 times t minus 3 is equal to. Unfortunately, I'm still a bit far from the answer there. Let's go step by step here, though, right? When we take the sine inverse of 7 over 11, if you recall, it went 180 degrees. Uh, sorry, and from zero to hundred, sorry, from zero to ninety degrees, there's only one possible answer. But now, in this in grade eleven math, we actually learned that um, from zero to three hundred sixty degrees, there's actually more than one answer. Um, and actually, there's going to be more answers in this case. Uh, so what we need to consider is that it's from zero to three sixty, for which the sine ratio is seven over eleven. So we look we look at the cast form. We know it's going to occur in two different quadrants, uh, the first quadrant and the second quadrant. So what we're going to do in this next part is figure out what the related acute angle is, which is 39.52. And we know that 39.52 is equal to 30t minus 90. Now we're not done with this question yet. What we are gonna do next is we're simply gonna make um, 39.52 equal to 30, 30t minus 90, which means that I then isolate, I'm not showing a lot of steps here, but hopefully this makes sense. I simply add 90 to both sides. So that gives me 30t is equal to 129.52. Um, and then I divide by t on both sides, and sort of divide by 30 on both sides, I end up getting, the first time at which uh, we reach a height of 20 meters, which is 4.32 seconds. Now, the hard thing with this question, and I understand that this is tricky, and I and um, but I wanted just to kind of challenge you a little bit more to see kind of how to do more tricky questions. So if, if, don't stress if you're not understanding this one. This one's tough, um, but I'm hoping you understand kind of algebraically how we isolate it for T. So keep in mind that this is only one of the possible answers because we already know that using the cast form, we talked about this, that there's another angle. So that means that the other angle, the other answer that we could possibly have is going to be 180 minus the related acute angle. So if the related acute angle, which we already found was 39.52, then that means that 30 times t minus 3 is also equal to 180 minus 39.52. Again, we had to consider the other possible answer. So 180 minus 39.52 gives us 140.48 approximately, which means that the other possible answer is that we add 90 to 140.48, and then simply divide by 30. We're just using inverse operations there. And that means that the other possible time we reach a height of 20 meters is 7.68 seconds. And you can even verify this yourself. So grab a calculator and just double check it. Uh, so we take the sign, so let's do the math here. So we take 30, so T minus three. So T minus three is gonna be, let's do the first one, 4.32 minus three. Then we take the sign of that. And then we multiply by 30, sorry, mul sorry, multiply by 30 first, sorry, made a mistake, 4.32 minus three, and then we multiply that by 30, and then we take the sign of that, and then we multiply that by 11, and then we add 13, I think you can see the answer now, it's 20. Okay, and then we can verify with this, the other answer, 7.68 minus three times 30, then take the sign of that answer, and then multiply by 11, I know it's lots of steps there, and then add 13, and you get 20. So again, when you're actually doing the calculations, be really careful with this, right? When you're subbing it, remember you do this, you do brackets first, right? And there's lots of brackets here. Do t minus three first, then multiply by 30, and then take the side of that answer, then take that answer, multiply by 11, then add 13, right? Uh, so I know a lot of little steps there. So just make sure that you're actually going through it. And I believe it's the same thing with this, with this question here. You want to take the product of 20 times five first, right? And then you find the sign of that answer and then multiply by 10, then out 11. So just be careful with the steps there. Okay, so we found our two answers and we verified they're definitely correct. Um, so are we done yet? Well, technically we're not done because the question asked, uh, when will it be a height of 20 meters? So there's actually gonna be more times than that. This is when it's gonna reach a height of 20 meters in the first in the first 12 hours, right? Uh, sorry, in the, yes, in the first 12 hours because that's what the period is, meters. So in the first cycle, it's gonna reach, uh, it's gonna reach 20 meters um, at 4.32 hours and at 7.68 hours. So we know that it's going to reach that. Uh, so we know that we know at which time it's going to reach a height of 20 meters. But if we did want to look for um, what happens outside of that cycle, we could do that. Um, and it is possible for you to look at what would happen in the next cycle, which is from 12 hours to 24 hours. So if you wanted to do that and you wanted to figure out when it's going to reach the height again, well, this isn't too bad, actually. You know that every every single period, every single time you you look at the next period, your your next cycle, your all your heights will start repeating. So if I want to figure out when is it going to reach a height of twenty meters again, I simply add twelve uh, hours to this because I know that every twelve hours, the heights will repeat. So I do the exact same thing for both answers. I take my answer four point three two, add twelve, and I do that for in both cases. And again, I can even draw this out. So I know it's going to reach a height of twenty meters. 
right there at 4.32 seconds and that's 7.68 seconds so if you're wondering when is it going to reach that height again well i know for a fact that it's going to what's well, going to look something like this it's going to start it's going to reach it's going to reach that uh that height of 20 meters again 12 hours after 4.32 after 4.32 hours and again 12 hours after 7.68 hours right so you simply add 12 hours to the two answers that you already have. So that means that we're going to reach the height of 20 meters again at 16.32 hours and at 19.68 hours. And that's when you're going to reach the height of 20 meters again. So a couple of final reminders that there's final reminders here that there's going to be uh, obviously multiple answers depending on which um, which function you decide to model with, whether it's positive sign, negative sign, positive cosine. And another thing to mention is that if you're not sure if this is correct or not, you can use decimals. That's fine. And it's always a good idea to just verify if it actually makes sense. So especially if you have time for the test, I would suggest that you actually draw out the graph on decimals or sketch it yourself and check. Does it actually make logical sense based on the description given? Um, I already mentioned that it's the same. No matter which cycle you choose, the only things that change are the D perimeter, which is the phase shift, as well as the sine of A. And of course, whether it's sine or cosine, right? Um, and in real life problems, don't forget about the limitations. So remember, sign can, time can only be positive and make sure you actually look at how many rotations you have there. So there's a homework and I made a point of uh, putting a hint here. Do not skip one to four. I will tell you it's pretty much pretty, pretty similar to that. So uh, be forewarned. Do not skip those questions because one of those questions is definitely going to be on the test. 100 percent guaranteed. Um, I think I already mentioned that it's uh, one question that deals with uh, a fictional character. Okay, I'll just say that. So hopefully you look through that question and hopefully you understand how to do it. All right, best of luck, guys. See ya.